So here at Peace Church, whenever we preach, come Sunday morning, we're going to open up the Bible, we're going to start at the beginning of a passage, or we're going to work our way to the end of a passage. But today, we're going to do things a little bit differently. We're actually going to start at the end of our passage today. And the reason is, is because today we're going to cover some, uh, what you might call some hot topics, some controversial topics. And as we walk through today's message, which I'm sure is going to be challenging to everybody at some point, I want to make sure that we're all pointed in the same direction, that we're all looking for the same outcome. And I think the very last verse of our passage helps us with that bullseye. We'll be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 today. You can start turning there now, but the very last verse of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 says this, Therefore, encourage one another with these words. For whatever we talk about today, forever how challenging, forever how outside the norm of maybe what you've been taught, my prayer is at the end is that you are encouraged by what you hear today. The passage we're looking at today, as we're going to be walking through 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it has this interesting phrase. Paul tells the Thessalonians, he says, you were taught by God. And he says, the reason I know that you were taught by God is because of the love that you have for each other. You, you Thessalonians, you have a great church because you love each other so much. I know that you were taught by God, and I also know that you were taught by God because you show yourself to be distinct from the world. You are truly living into this holy calling because you love each other and because you are distinct from the world. I know that you were taught by God. And that begs the question for us, are we taught by by God. And if we're not taught by God, then what are we taught by? Tradition? The world? So my prayer is today is as we go through this, that you feel in your soul that you are actually being taught by God, not by some man, but by the word of God. And so a little context for you as you are finding yourselves hopefully by, or at First Thessalonians. What we're going to be reading today is a letter, actually. The technical term is an epistle, an epistle. The Apostle Paul planted this church in this town called Thessalonica in this region called Macedonia. And sometimes later, he writes back, he writes a letter back to the Thessalonians, that's why we call it Thessalonians, the first letter that we have, to encourage them and to answer some theological questions that they have. So, just by way of a fun little note, we still, Thessalonica is still a, still a city, still a town. These days, except now we call it Thessaloniki. We don't call it Macedonia, we call it Greece. So, with that, would you hear the word of the Lord? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it'll be up on the screen as we look at a message today how we are taught by God. So, follow along in your Bibles or up on the screen. Paul writes this Finally, then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know that, uh, for you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passions of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter because the Lord is an avenger in all these things. And as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you, for God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that is indeed what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do so, to do this more and more, and to aspire to live quietly, and to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we, instru- as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Verse 13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who, have, who are asleep. That means those who have died. About those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord 
that we who are alive, we who are left at the, uh, until the coming of the Lord, we will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of a command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is God's word, everyone. Let's pray, and then we'll get started. Lord in heaven, we thank you that on this day we are reminded that we can call you Father, that you are close as a father to us. And so as we seek to glorify you, we ask that by your Holy Spirit, which you have given to us, whom you have put into us, Holy Spirit, we ask that you would teach us your truth today, that we may become more like Jesus Christ, the Savior, in whose name we pray. And everyone said, amen, amen. amen. So if you want to have influence in someone's life, start off on a positive note, like Paul does here. Right here, right away in verse 1, he tells them, you guys are doing a great job. You're following the call. You're living a life pleasing to God. Keep doing this. In fact, he clarifies for them even more. He says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. Now, what does sanctification mean? It simply means holiness. And technically, sanctification is the process by which we become holy. To be sanctified is to be holy. Sanctification is the process by which we become holy. Again, that does not mean we are perfect. It just means that we are distinct. We are called out unique among the world as God's chosen ones. And he says, this is the will of God. This is God's will for you, your holiness. But I know that some of us will look at this and will say, uh, God's will for us is our holiness. Hold on a second here, Paul. I think you have a typo. You put holiness, but I think what you meant was happiness. God's will for us is our happiness. Right, Paul? And you know, I'm sure Paul would have listened to some American with some thick American accent say that. And he probably would have raised an eyebrow. And I'm sure his response would have been something to the effect of, Well, that surely is a short-sighted, self-centered way to understand life now, isn't it? No, God's call for you does not start with happiness. It starts with holiness, that we are to be holy. And if we are actually going through the process of sanctification, that means the Holy Spirit is alive in you, that he's working in you. And the Bible tells us if that's actually happening, then joy is one of the products of this. Joy is one of the ways that we know this is happening. So no, no, Americans, we do not start with happiness. We start with holiness, with the Holy Spirit working in us, of which we see many of the fruit of the Spirit produced, but not least of which is is joy. God wants us to be holy. That holiness is the grounding for our identity in Jesus, and that joy is produced from this. And just to make sure there's no misunderstandings here, Paul goes on to even clarify what exactly he means by this. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, your holiness, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Now, the the phrase here, sexual immorality, is two words in English. It was actually one word in the original language. It was the word porneia. It does not mean pornography, but it is where we get the word pornography from. And because we are a family-friendly environment, um, I'll try to keep this G-rated. Porneia, uh, porneia, sexual immorality, simply refers to illicit or improper physical intimacy. Which begs the question, what is proper physical intimacy? Well, from the earliest pages of Scripture, affirmed all the way through to the very end, we see that God's design because he loves us for our joy is that sex is reserved and it is protected as something special to happen only within the context of a marriage between one man and one woman in a covenantal, lifelong, selfless union. But I know that many of us are uh, been fully conditioned by our culture and we hear that 
And our knee-jerk reaction is one of disgust because that sounds so old-fashioned and it sounds not very inclusive. But you have to understand the, abs- the, the historical context of what this letter was written in. This, was, this letter was written during the time of the Roman Empire, during the time of the Roman occupation. When scriptures taught this, there was a hierarchy among society like we could never understand. There were those in power and those without power. And that was basically the, the distinction between people. And those with power... They could fulfill their sexual urges upon those without power whenever they wanted. That was their society. That was their context. Now, if you just heard me say that and you, and you think, well, well, that's terrible. It is. But let me explain why you think that. It's because you also have been conditioned by the, the Christian sexual ethic that is to honor one another. We think it's terrible because what Christ taught about sex is ingrained in our culture, but yet we take it for granted. Let me explain. When Paul, and we see in the Bible, write that sex is reserved for one man and for one woman in a mutually committed, covenantal, lifelong relationship that is meant to reflect the love of God, that was an absolutely revolutionary teaching. And it did something so, so dramatic. To teach that, what that did was it elevated the worth of every single human to the same status. So we're not powerful and impowerful. Every person deserves the same. And so they lifted that up, and it also raised the value of marriage to an absolutely holy level. In the Roman culture, people had license to basically do anything. But Paul, in the midst of this, he gives a radical call for self-control. No, you can't fulfill your urges on anyone you wish. You need to be composed and controlled that you abstain from sexual immorality, and that each of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passions of lust like the Gentiles. Gentiles just means the nations, the world around them, the people of the nations around them, not like the rest of the world who does not know God. Do you see what Paul is saying here? What he's saying here is it doesn't matter what your attraction is. We are not slaves to the passions of our bodies like the rest of the world. We are to control ourselves in holiness and honor. It is not honorable to have sex with anyone and everyone. That's not who we are called to be in Christ. The Roman world would have heard that and they would have said, wait, no, I am free to have sex with whoever I want. And you know what? Americans... We say the same thing, except we tag on this little moral caveat. See, we would say a person is free to have sex with whoever they want as long as it's with a consenting adult. That is the great sexual ethic of our time. In the history of humanity, when you say that a person can have sex with whoever they want as long as it's a consenting adult, they would have said 21st century Americans. That is a culturally conditioned way to understand sex. This is the prevailing sexual ethic of our time. But do you know where we got that moral caveat from of a consenting adult? It's derived from the Christian teaching from God that said that each person has equal worth and is not meant to be taken advantage of. But like every moral endeavor for uh, for us, we treat it like an a la carte where we take what we want and we leave the rest. Christians, I'm speaking to Christians here. If you were to agree that sex is to freely happen between consenting adults, if you're going to jump on that moral, logical bandwagon, then logically speaking, this is the moral grounding for polyamory, group marriages. This is the moral grounding for pornography to both be produced and to be viewed. This is the moral grounding for anything else that consenting adults aspire to. But the Christian teaching, the true Christian teaching says no to the Roman world and it says no to the American condition. It says, no Romans, you cannot fulfill your sexual desires upon anyone without power. No Americans, you are not to fulfill your sexual desires upon any consenting adult. The world's ethics have always led to abuse and to chaos. The Christian sexual ethic has boundaries 
that is meant to maintain honor and maintain self-control, which is meant to protect people. And it's meant to protect the beauty of sexual purity and to ensure that it's to be enjoyed between a man and a woman who have a lifelong, covenantal, selfless, committed relationship for their lives. I know this is making a lot of people real uneasy. And I know a lot of people are really upset with what I'm saying right now. I'm here to tell you, I'm a Christian preaching to the church. Christians, stop trying to fit in. You were not meant to. Our moral and sexual ethic has always stood apart from the prevailing culture for 2,000 years. It stood apart in the Roman world. It it still stands apart in the American world. All people, all societies draw lines around their sexual ethic. Everyone, every culture has boundaries to some aspect. But here's what concerns me. The world is ever changing those boundaries. We're ever changing the boundaries of our sexual ethics. And we baptize it by calling it progress. Or maybe we give into it because of our big hearts, because of personal friendships. But what concerns me is the limitless nature of it all. If every generation has license to push the boundaries of what is accepted sexually, then where does it end? Listen to me. I'm not trying to like instill fear because of some slippery slope. I'm trying to ask what is the logical outcome if we keep pushing the boundaries? What God has taught us, he's taught us because he loves us. He's taught it because this is his design for us for all time, no matter what culture we find ourselves in. And to this, and to this people would say, well, what about people's happiness? Don't people deserve to be happy? Listen to me. God wants more for you than your happiness. I know we think that is the be-all to end-all. If you're happy, then you've arrived as a person. No. It's when we are holy. It's when God calls us out and we live into this holy calling, that we live into the Holy Spirit that God has given into us. That's what God wants for us. And from that, when we truly pursue that, joy is a product. I mean, but Paul is no short on challenges for us today. I mean, look at these next couple verses. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. We are given the Holy Spirit so that we might walk in holiness. And from that emerges not happiness, but joy. But listen to these verses, because Paul continues to give the challenges. And aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs as we might say, mind your own beeswax, (laughs) to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly in good form, that you may walk becomingly before outsiders and be dependent upon no one. Simply put, don't be a jerk. When the world around you looks at your life, show them holiness, show them honest work, Set a good example for them. Paul is telling us, work on living a good life before the Lord and before other people. Why? Why? Because history has a bookend. Because the gospel is going to come full circle. Listen to me. If, if the universe is open-ended and we're just all progressing into a nothingness, then sure, whatever goes. But if something is going to come full circle, if history has a bookend, then we need to take, we need to take, take note. This is all leading somewhere. This is all leading something to something and somewhere to which we must be prepared. You see, the Thessalonians, uh, one of the questions they had for Paul is they were concerned about fellow Christians who had died. And they wanted to know what was going to happen to them. And so Paul is comforting them. And in verses 13 to 18, he tries to comfort them. And by them, we should still be comforted because he's telling us that for those who have died in Christ, when the kingdom comes, those who have died in Christ are the first to enter. Do not 
worry about them. They are not lost. They are with Jesus, and they will be coming back with him. And so, as if the sex talk and as if the death talk weren't enough, Paul goes on to give two of the most controversial verses in all the Bible. So we're going to take it phrase by phrase as we see what the bookend of history begins to look like. So let's take this phrase by phrase. Paul says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven. Jesus, who rose from the dead and ascended to heaven, he is coming back, and the gospel will come full circle. And he will descend from heaven with the cry of a command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. The king is returning. And it will be a royal and a grand entrance. With the cry of a command, this is, a, this is one of authority. With the voice of the archangel, this is Jesus coming in power. And with the sound of the trumpet of God. For the Jewish context, you read the Old Testament, the trumpet sound always signified the presence of the Lord. The sound of the trumpet of God, Jesus coming back, is God returning to earth. This is not an alien invasion. This is the Lord descending with his people. And the dead in Christ will rise first. This is the great promise of the Christian faith. That Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. And those who believe in him, though they die, yet shall they live. But what about us? Those who have died get to be with Jesus, come back with him, great. But what about us who are alive when Jesus comes back? Well, Paul hits that. Then we who are alive, we who are left, we will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Drum roll, please. This is the infamous rapture verse. The word rapture actually comes from the Latin. It's the Latin translation of the Greek word harpizo, which we translate as to be caught up. So in Latin, it's rapture. In Greek, it's harpizo. It's actually where we get our word harpoon. You harpoon something and bring it up. In Latin, it's rapture. In Greek, it's harpizo. And in English, we say to be caught up. Paul says that we will be raptured. We will be harpizo. That we will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord as he descends from heaven. It's in the clouds that we will be brought up to meet the Lord in the air. And one of the most critical pieces to understand this when we are talking about the rapture and the doctrine of Christ's return is what we mean is what Paul means when he talks about this meeting in the air. The word you'll find in the text, uh, this meeting to meet is a noun. It's the Greek word apontes. And it meant a meeting in the sense of what we would call a reception. A reception. We will be caught up in the air as a reception party to meet Jesus as he returns to earth. That's what this word means. We see it two other times in scripture. In Matthew, Matthew 25, in this parable, Jesus gives when there's this groom. And before the wedding, this groom leaves. And the wedding party waits for the groom. And they see the groom coming back for the wedding. And so the, the wedding party, they go out and they have an impontes. They have a reception and they meet the groom on his way to the wedding. That's in a parable. We actually see this also in Acts 28 when Paul is coming to Rome. And right before he gets to the city, the Christians of Rome, they know Paul is coming. So they go outside the city to Apontes to meet with Paul and to receive him in a reception party. And as they bring him and as he goes into the city, into Rome. Now, culturally speaking, we don't really do that here in 21st century America the closest thing we have to this would be like if when you're at home and you're having someone come over to your house and they get there and they knock on the door, you get up and you go to the door and you greet them. You apontes with them and then you bring them into your house. Unless it's your neighbor and you're just like, come in. But more formally, that's a, that's a more formal reception. We get up and we greet someone at the door. See, the, the, the Roman world in antiquity, they would have taken it a step farther. They actually would have left their house. They may have even gone outside the city to welcome people in. They were a very hospitable culture. And so when Jesus returns, we will be raptured 
to meet Jesus at the door of the sky to welcome him and join him as he returns in power. Do I pray for the rapture? Do I pray for the rapture every single day? Every single day. Even though I'm 41, I'm tired. I, I, I look at this world and I'm like, any day now, Lord. You're welcome back any day. Do I pray for the rapture every day? But some of you might say, whoa, whoa wait a second here. Whoa, 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 whoa. I, I thought the rapture was when we like disappear from the earth and our clothes get left behind and the Lord takes us into heaven for seven years while the rest of the world goes to pot. Now, that is a theology that many people I love and trust would teach, but that is in light of this passage and piecing together other verses throughout Scripture. And my critique of this is that sometimes I think we put together verses that aren't meant to be put together in some sort of timeline. I think when we read this passage here, and by the way, in 2 Thessalonians, which we'll get to in the future, Paul revisits this idea and kind of reemphasizes this idea that we come and meet Jesus as he returns to heaven. So I want to stick with the verse before us. We could take time and join the chorus of debate trying to parse out exactly how the end times will play out. But when you look here at this verse, and when you look at this last part, I think you see what is the most clear. Then we who are alive, we who are left, will be caught up together with the clouds, uh, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. For whatever you believe about the end times, however you believe it will play out, or how exactly the rapture will go, I think this is the most important part, that at our rapture, we will never again be apart from our Savior. Last week, my boys, my two boys, my two middle children, my two boys, went to basketball camp. They're little guys, so it was just a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday night deal for a couple hours. And so we told them we signed them up for basketball camp and we got them really excited about basketball camp. And on our way, when I was taking them to basketball camp uh, on the first night, they started asking all sorts of questions about basketball camp. And I realized they have no frame of reference for what they're about to experience. And so they're asking all sorts of questions. Who's going to be there? Who, who's our coach? What group will we be in? Do I need a basketball? Will I be able to use the bathroom? Can I get a drink of water? I mean, like, the questions were nonstop. And I'm sitting there driving to basketball camp, looking at them in the rear view mirror, and I'm trying to answer all their questions, and I realized I know what they need to hear. I said, boys, boys, dad's not going to leave you. I'm staying with you the whole time. And you know what happened? Their shoulders rolled back. They sat back in their chair. They looked out the window. They enjoyed the ride, and they were excited for what was to come. All they needed to hear was that I was going to stay with them. They were encouraged by those words. They were encouraged by this. Paul points to this monumental event of the rapture, and what do we do? We start throwing out all sorts of questions because we have no frame of reference for this. And so we start throwing out all these questions, looking for all the verses of the Bible to try and get our questions answered. But I think Paul tells us here what we need to know, that at that moment, when we are raptured, we will always be with the Lord. And I think that's why Paul ends by saying, Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Because our great hope of what God is teaching us is that when Jesus comes back, until that happens, we are to live holy lives in preparation for his return. Holy lives that are meant for our good as we experience the love of God in anticipation for the culmination of all things. And until that great, grand, and glorious moment, sit back. Enjoy the ride. Get excited for what's coming, knowing that when it happens, we'll be with our Savior and never again be separated from him. Amen. Would you please stand?